welcome to Movement Church. I'm Chris, I'm the pastor here at Movement. I wanna extend an extra special welcome to you as you're joining us today on this Sunday on Father's Day. If you're watching live with us on Father's Day, happy Father's Day, especially if you're a dad, happy Father's Day. We're so glad that you're watching with us. If you're catching up with us sometime else, elsewise through the week, Happy Father's Day to you too, but we're so glad that you're joining us today. Today is part three of our series called Supreme, where we're looking at the book of Colossians and looking at the life of Jesus and finding out just how supreme Jesus is. And so today we got a, an, an incredible message. I've got an incredibly challenging message, but I think it's also encouraging and hopeful because it leads us somewhere really good. So if there's someone you know that needs to take a first step or a next step in relationship with Jesus, man, I would love to encourage you to share this, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook or however you find a way to share this, just you know, send a text message to someone with the link and say, hey, you need to check this video out, man. I would love for you to do that because we really believe this content has the power to help someone take a first step and our next step in relationship with Jesus that changes their lives forever. And so today, without any further ado, I'm gonna jump right into part three of Supreme. All right, we're in week three of our summer series, Supreme, where we're talking about Jesus because, well, we're in church and we're talking about Jesus, but also because in Paul's letters to the church in Colossae, it's all about Jesus. It's all Jesus all the time because Paul wanted them to be sure they knew and had confidence, not just in what Jesus did, but in who Jesus is. And there's this word that Paul uses over and over again throughout the letter to describe Jesus, and it's the word that we have used as the title for this series, Supreme. It's the word supreme. And in the first two weeks, we've been unpacking why Jesus is actually supreme. The first week, we looked at the opening of Colossians and saw that Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. We said that Jesus is the supreme display of who God is and what God is like, that Jesus didn't have the best explanation of God. Jesus himself is the best explanation of God. And then last week, we picked up right after that verse as Paul unpacked what makes Jesus supreme. And it's that Jesus is the supreme source, the supreme sustainer, and supreme foundation of our life and our faith. He starts it all. He holds it all together. He sustains it all. And as we said last week, our life only makes sense to the degree that we have embraced the reality that our life begins in him. It continues because of him. And our faith and a connection with God exists because of his life that came out of the grave. Now, today we're going to skip right over Colossians chapter 2, not because it's not important, but because I really wanted to spend today and next week in Colossians chapter 3. And today specifically, I want to give you the word that's going to guide our whole thought process today. And it's the simple word, goal. Goal. Matter of fact, if you're watching online, if you're, if you're, if you're in the chat bar where you can comment in the chat bar, would you type in the word goal? G-O-A-L, goal. Now, when you hear goal, you may think of soccer or football or hockey or some other sporting version of a goal. But for most of us, when we think of goal, we think of those things in life that we set in front of us as something that we want to attain or something that we want to accomplish. Maybe something that we want to become. Maybe something that we want to lose. Maybe something that we want to get rid of. Maybe something that we want to be free of. Maybe something that we like, that's off in the future that we do not have, that we have not attained, that we have not accomplished yet, but we want to in the future. And since this message is coming to you live on Father's Day, I thought it might be fitting to share with you some rather funny goals from children when asked in one way or another what they wanted to do or what, the, what they wanted to accomplish in life or in their future. So here's the first one. This comes from a, a child named Edwin. He was asked what he wanted to be doing by 2013. I don't know when this was asked to him, but here's, here's he, was, he was six. He said in 2013, this is what he wanted to have true of him. He, number one is he wanted to learn to fly. Pretty ambitious. Number two is he wanted to play the accordion. I think we could all agree, maybe leave Edwin, you don't need to learn that. Number three is he wanted to play uh, professional soccer. Number four is he wanted to get an iPhone 5. I don't even remember what year iPhone 5 was, but that was a while ago. And uh, he said, P.S., I am six, okay? So he's six, and in the future, he wanted to learn to fly, he wanted to play the accordion, he wanted to play professional soccer, and get an iPhone 5. Some pretty good goals for Edwin. Uh, there's another one, uh, the ne next one I found, um, this is this, what they said, what I like best about school is playing with Miles. When I grow up, I wanna be a doctor, a stay-at-home mama, a nurse, 
and a cheese cutter. Now on Father's Day, can we agree that a child who wants to be a cheese cutter is actually pretty darn funny, okay? I would also like to everyone to know I like to paint with my whole family and do sidewalk chalk. This kid has some dreams. They want to be a doctor and a stay-at-home mama and a nurse and a professional cheese cutter who likes to paint and do sidewalk chalk. Some pretty good goals in life. Another one, someday I will have so much food to eat that I'll explode. Isn't that, the li- isn't that the dream for most of us, right? Like, I want to have so much food that I'll explode. This, is, this, this one came from someone in August 2014, first day of kinder prep. When I grow up, I want to be black Spider-Man. Whew, that sounds awesome. I think that'd be great too. Like, I, w- I want to do all that. That sounds like a wonderful goal. 100-year-old me, when I am 100, I will play Uno with my grandchildren. I will wear a sweater all of the time. I will take naps every day, and I will take my wife to Pizza Hut for dinner. Who doesn't want to do that when they're 100? Like, that's what I think, like, I want to do that now. I want to take a nap every day. I want to take my wife to Pizza Hut for now. Like, you're like, you could. Uh, maybe I will. Maybe I'll do that tonight, okay? And here's, here's, here's the final one. They, someone was asked what they'll be doing in 20 years. A child was asked what they'll be doing in 20 years. In 20 years, I'll be 32 years old and working at Kmart. Now, I got bad news in two, on two fronts for that kid. Number one, no, no matter when that was, Kmart doesn't really exist anymore, so I'm sorry that that dream has died, but chances are if your dream is Kmart, you're dreaming a little bit too small. Anyway, here's what we're talking about. When we, can, we, we can all laugh at those kids because we know so, some of us were those kids. You had a dream that someday you were going to work at Kmart. You had a dream that you were going to take your wife on fancy dinners to Pizza Hut. You had dreams that you were going to become a doctor and a stay-at-home. Like, you're going to do all, like, we, we all, some of us, we were those those kids and we had some crazy ideas of what we would accomplish and what we would achieve in life but we also know that that spirit of dreaming and hoping and achieving when we are young it doesn't really ever go away it doesn't ever really go away it just comes out a little bit more refined and that spirit is actually what fuels most of our dreams and our goals today see here's the truth the truth is that our goals reveal what we think will make tomorrow better than today There is in every single one of us a desire for tomorrow to be better than today. And what we set as our goals, it reveals what we think will make tomorrow better than today. Anytime we set a goal, we ultimately reveal what we think will lead to a better future for ourselves, for our family, for the people that we care about the most. Why did that kid want to be a doctor and a mom and a cheese cutter in the future? Because that's what would make tomorrow better than today for them. Why do you want to lose weight? When you set a goal to lose weight, when I set a goal to lose weight, why do we actually set goals to lose weight? Because we think that that will make tomorrow better than today, or it will allow us to have a tomorrow, right? Like when 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 you set a goal that you want to get a promotion by this time of next year, why do you want a promotion? Because you think it will make tomorrow better than today. Why set a goal to buy a home in the next six months? Spoiler alert: If you have a goal to buy a home in the next six months. Don't, um, but why, why would you have a goal to buy a home in the next six months? Because you think it makes tomorrow better than today. Why set a goal to finish college debt-free? You think it makes tomorrow better than today or makes a better version of tomorrow than having debt, right? Why do, you, why do 20-year-olds want to be married by the time they turn 25? Because they think it's a better reality, a better version of tomorrow. Why do people with no children think about and plan out how many children they want to have? Like, isn't that, isn't that a silly thing? Like, you don't even have one yet. How do you know you want five? Like, you don't, like, yeah, that's a, that's, but that's a thing that we do because we think having five will make a, be, a better version of tomorrow than, than today or a better version than having two or a better version than having three or a better version than having none. Why do we set goals of how much we want to save for retirement? Because we believe that there is a version of tomorrow that will be better if we have saved for retirement for now. Why do we set New Year's resolutions at the beginning of the year to spend more time prayer and more time reading the Bible? Because we believe that that will make us better in our connection with God. It'll make, t- make tomorrow's connection with God better than today's. Why do we set goals to read X number of books in a month or in a year's time? It makes tomorrow a better, makes us better for tomorrow. So with all of that, there's nothing wrong with any of that, right? Again, just like we said last week, those are all good things. There's nothing wrong with any of that. I want tomorrow to be better than today. I want the future to be better than the present. And no matter how good the present is, I want tomorrow to be better. The, the, the only problem with that is that if you lose all the weight you want to lose, and if you have all the money that you want to have, and if you buy the house you want to have, and you buy the car that you want to have, and you send your kids to the school that you want to like, chances are you may still have a hunger that has not been satisfied, and you may actually find that what you did while you were 
reaching all of those goals was you were reaching for things that would not actually fulfill you, that wouldn't actually make tomorrow better than today. They just met a goal. They didn't actually really make your life any better. They didn't actually improve your quality of life. They didn't actually improve you. And so today, what I want to look at is I want to simply look to Colossians 3, and I want us to see that Paul presents a version of tomorrow that is better. Paul actually doesn't just, as, as we talked the first week, it's not just better. It's not just best. It's not just superior. It's actually a supreme picture of tomorrow. And what Paul is going to unpack in the, few, in the few verses that we're going to look at today is simply this, that the best way to ensure that tomorrow is better than today is to make sure we aim our lives at the right goal. And some of us, our goals are far too small. Some of us, when, when our goal is lose weight and save money and do this and travel more and get the house and get the girl and have the kid, like, like, our, like those are things that are going to happen in life regardless. Those things are too small of a goal for your life. If you aim your life at those things, you may accomplish those things, but you will miss out on the bigger things in life. And the best way, as Paul is gonna unpack, to make sure that tomorrow is better than today is to make sure that we are better when it comes to tomorrow. And the best way to make sure that we are better is to aim our lives at the right goal. So here's what he says in Colossians chapter three. He says, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the reality of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Let me read that one more time. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Now that's a fascinating, like that one verse, we could probably actually spend all day on that. But what we're going to go as, as we look to the next few verses, all of it flows out of that verse but there's a couple interesting phrases, and it's interesting because of there's, there's two three-word combinations at the beginning and end of Paul's instructions. There's set your sights on the realities of heaven. Set your sights, realities of heaven. Set your sights simply would translate best as fix your gaze or aim your life at that you move in the direction of, that you fix your eyes, you fix your gaze, you fix yourself on moving toward this direction. He says, fix your gaze, aim your life. In other words, Paul is about to give us here in Colossians 3, the goal to aim our lives at. This is a big deal. We don't want to move too quickly past this, right? Paul is about to give us the goal. That if, that if getting the girl or getting the guy or having the kids or getting the house or getting the car or losing the weight or getting out of college debt free, if all you are starting the own bit, like whatever it is, if that's too small of a goal, as good as all of those things are, if that's too small of a goal, we should make sure we pay attention to what Paul is about to say because Paul is about to say, this is the goal worth aiming your life at. At. This is the thing that he wants us to aim our lives at in response to the Jesus being the dis supreme display of life, in response to be Jesus being the supreme source of life and the supreme sustainer of life. And what are we supposed to set our eyes on? What are you supposed to fix your gaze on? What are we supposed to aim our lives at? As Paul says, you're supposed to set your sights on the realities of heaven. The realities of of heaven. Now we are living in a really interesting time in relation to the world reality, aren't we? I mean, like, like the word reality seems to have taken on a whole lot of different meaning in our world. Just a few weeks ago, Apple announced their entry, entry into the virtual reality, augmented reality space with their new headset, the Vision Pro, which allows you to use virtually any app or movie or show or game that exists for the phone or for the Mac or for the iPad in a virtual space that only you see through the eyes of the headset. Is that reality? No. Is it a virtual reality? Sure, whatever, whatever that means. That adds on to the already competitive world of VR gaming that's been pushed by Meta Quest and PlayStation's VR2 headset. On top of all that, we have the rise of AI-created images and videos that has become so advanced, it's very difficult at times to recognize the difference between something that is real and something that's been created by generative AI. 
Matter of fact, if you jump on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, chances are today you will see some things that have been created by AI and you may not recognize that they have been created by AI. A number of weeks ago, there was a, a number of images going around on Facebook that had people up in arms. And in the original post, it was said, this was created by AI. It was the last thing that was stated. No one read that. They just believed what they saw because this was something that they kind of already Thought might be true true anyway. And it was created by AI. It was never real. And so like we live in a world where it's very easily easy to be deceived into thinking something that is reality when it is not, in fact, reality. On top of that, like let's just be honest, it seems on every side of our world, on every side of the political spectrum, on every side of the opinion spectrum, we have people and groups that in some ways can't accept or refuse to admit reality. Like, I want to start going down the list, but I know if I started going down the list in ways, in a list of ways in which humans won't accept earthly realities right now, before long, I'll take off absolutely everyone watching today, and it's Father's Day, and I don't want everyone to hate me, but certainly we can all agree, and we can all think of someone else that lives in a world that has a difficult relationship with the, wor- with the earthly reality. And chances are, there's someone who thinks of, you as having a difficult time accepting or admitting some earthly realities. But Paul, while knowing that we, we at times have a difficult you know, relationship with the idea of earthly realities, he says, while earthly reality can be confusing and while earthly reality can be misleading and while earthly reality can be, you know, like, like where there's information on both sides and you don't know which one is actually true, while there's all of that, Paul says, look, At the end of the day, what matters most is not that you set your eyes on earthly realities, which are changing, and not that you set your your eyes on the, you set your life towards the realities of this world, which are really confusing, and not that you change your, you you set your life toward the realities of this world, which like who, who, who's to say which side is actually right. He says, I want you to set your eyes and set your life and aim your life at the realities of heaven. That's what, that what is real in heaven, what is reality in heaven is the lasting reality of our eternal life. And here, like, that this is what Paul says. I want you to aim your life at what will last forever, not at what will last for a short period of time. I want you to aim your life at the realities of heaven, that there is eternal life. I don't want you to aim your, like, your life at this world. If you aim your life at this world, you will miss out on heaven. If you aim your life at heaven, you will get everything that God has for you in the here and now as well. Paul says, here's what you aim your life at. You aim your life at what will be true forever, not what seems to be true now. So here's a couple of, if you're like, what, what what are these realities of heaven? Paul would say the realities of heaven is that life is eternal, not temporary. So we invest our life into what is eternal, not into what is temporary. Meaning there are things that seem like they matter a lot right now because it matters right now that has absolutely no bearing and no significance when it comes to eternity. And if we're going to invest into eternity, we pay attention to what will last for eternity. And here's what matters for eternity. Everyone will spend eternity somewhere. You will spend your eternity somewhere. You will spend forever somewhere. Now you're spending temporary in Las Cruces or in New Mexico or in the United States or in wherever you're watching from today. That's where you're spending your temporary. And your temporary might change to a different location for a, a, for a decade of your life or for another, like, but that's where you're spending your temporary. Where you will spend eternity will be determined by what you choose in the temporary, by who you choose in the temporary. Did you choose Jesus in the temporary? Did you choose that Jesus in the temporary? Well, I can't see, well, I don't know. Well, well, this isn't the, the ultimate reality. This is the reality of my life right now. I choose in this version of, in this temporary reality to fix my eyes on the one who saved me from eternity spent away from God. I choose to spend eternity with him. So I'm gonna focus on him now so that I can also experience eternity with him that what we choose now impacts where we will spend eternity. Let me give you another reality of heaven, is that God's truth is truth. That what God says is true. And and we we all kind of have this idea, our culture has taught us and convinced us all, and no matter how long you've been in the church world, chances are you've got some version of this that you've applied in your own life, that like, well, this is my truth. 
This is my truth. And that's wonderful to have your truth. That's fantastic. I hope you catch the sarcasm in my voice already. That's wonderful to have your truth, but your truth will not set you free. The truth will set you free. When you wrap your mind and when you wrap your life around that God, what God says is real truth, that God's truth will set you free, that God's truth can save you, that God's truth transforms you, but your truth, what you have believed of like, well, this is my version, this is what makes me happy. Like you can spend your whole life chasing that, or you can wrap your whole entire life around God's truth because one will satisfy and one will leave you hungry forever. One will, one is the reality of heaven. One is the ever-changing, ever-shifting kind of reality of the earth. One is worth building your life on and one is worth throwing into the fire. Here's another reality. Jesus is Lord. This is the reality of heaven. Jesus is Lord. So Paul says, fix your eyes and wrap your entire life on the realities of heaven. Here's what's, what's real in heaven. Jesus is Lord. And, if I, and, and to, to wrap my mind around that, to wrap my life around that, to fix my gaze on that, to make that the goal of my life, the target of my life, is to say that what's true in heaven will be true in my life. And so Jesus is Lord in heaven, that I make Jesus the Lord of my life, and I submit everything I have and everything I am to him. Paul comes out smoking in Colossians chapter three. He says, set your gaze, set your sights on the reality of heaven. Set your sights on the reality of heaven. Then he goes on and says, says this, think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. And when Christ who is your life is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. This speaks to our identity. He says, have we, have we aligned ourselves primarily with Jesus or with something else? The things of heaven aligned with God and found my identity in him or consumed with the things of earth aligned with the earth and finding my identity in something that is in the here and now, not in what will last forever. But note what Paul says. Paul doesn't say you left your old life behind or you moved on from that part of your life. Paul says, when you came to Jesus, you died to this life. You died to the here and now. You died to the to the to the what we perceive as reality. You died to what matters in the here and now. You and what matters most in this life are the things that will matter in the life to come. Paul uses this word hidden. This word hidden wherever you are, would you say the word hidden? That there are things hidden with Christ. And that doesn't mean it's some mystery that we can't find. It means there are things that to the untrained eye, it would seem they don't matter so much right now because it has to deal with a lot of stuff that doesn't show right now. But he says, there will be a day when everything that's unseen will be seen and it will be revealed. And the things that you invest in that don't seem to matter right now, that don't seem to make a difference right now, that don't add a dollar to your bank account right now, but actually maybe lose a, some dollars from your bank account, that when you pass on a job promotion because it allows you more time to invest in the lives of your, ch your children and your church. He says, these are the things that the world won't see right now, but it will be shown because right now those things are hidden in Christ. And when Christ is revealed to the whole world, when he comes back in all of his glory, we will get to share in his glory and everything that we invested when we invested in him will be revealed. It's hidden now because it's with Christ right now. We're investing into the unseen world so that what is, see, what is unseen but is eternal, when, when the eternal reality becomes our reality, we get to enjoy the things that we invested in now. So here's the thing. This is just important for, to, as your pastor to, to make sure that you understand. You can look foolish in the temporary while being wise in what matters forever, or you can look wise in the temporary while being foolish in what matters forever. What will you invest your life? What have you identified your life? What have you wrapped your identity around? Have you wrapped your identity around Jesus and what matters for eternity, what matters forever? Or are you wrapping your, mind, your, your, your identity around things that are very, very temporary and will be here today and gone tomorrow and certainly will not be here forever? You can look foolish in the temper. This, this is the goal that we would look foolish in the temporary while being wise in what matters forever. And so Paul then, after, after, after these bombs that he has dropped, you know, just coming out absolutely firing in, in Colossians chapter three, he says this, so 
Meaning because of all that, if you've identified with Jesus, if you're wrapping your entire life up in what matters forever, if you have set your sights on the realities of heaven where Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God, if you're focused on the realities of heaven that Jesus is Lord, that what God says is true, and that everyone will spend eternity somewhere, including you, if you've done that, here's what you should do. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Now, notice here, Paul addresses this inner world. He says, you know, impurity, lust. Well, lust isn't something that happens outside until it happens outside, but lust starts inside. Evil desires start inside. Greed is inside until greed works its way out of you, but this is internal stuff. He says, so put to death the stuff that's inside of you that doesn't belong inside of you if you're wrapping your entire lives around, around the fact that Jesus is Lord and that God, what God says is true and that everyone will spend eternity somewhere. If you, if you have that stuff inside of you, Paul would say, you've got some stuff inside of you that's really attracted to the stuff of the here and now and, this, and that stuff needs to be put to death so that you can desire the things of eternity. And then he goes on, he says this, because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world. He says, but now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Now you're like, wait, wait, that seems like a different list. It is a different list. That first list was all the stuff inside. And Paul says, you got to work on that stuff from the inside, because if you don't work on that stuff from the inside, it's going to work its way to the outside. And it's going to damage your relationships and it's going to affect your behavior and it's going to affect how you treat people. It's going to affect how you see people. If you've got lust in your heart, it's going to affect how you see other people. If you've got greed in your heart, you're, it's going to affect how you see other people, how you treat other people, how you, you know, like what you would, would sacrifice, you know, in, in the here and now, what, we, we, what you would trade eternity for in the here and now. Like, it's going to affect that. But now in this list, Paul says, well, these are all behaviors, so this is all the stuff inside of you, and this is all the behavior. So you've got to get rid of anger. You've got to get rid of rage. Well, rage comes out of you. You've got to get rid of malicious behavior. That's something that comes out of you. You've got to get rid of slander. Slander is something that comes from your mouth and works its way towards other people. You've got to get rid of the dirty language. Some of you, you're like, I, I, but, but what if I can't say that's what she said all the time? I think that might be like, what if I can't drop F-bombs all the time? Well, maybe that's something that God wants to work on because Paul includes that in here just in the same list as people who have anger and a rage problem. He says, don't lie to each other. That's something that happens externally towards other people. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature and its wicked deeds. Paul has a list of things that happen from the inside out and a list of things that happen and affect you from the outside in. But here's what you know. It happens from the outside in because when you're anger, you end up internally feeling guilt. When you express rage, you afterwards, you're like, oh, I can't believe I did that again. When you slander someone else, you know internally you carry a guilt because you destroyed a reputation. You destroyed the way other people will see a person. When you use dirty language, you're like, that's like... I'm, I'm, I'm more intelligent than that. I don't have to use dirty language to be funny. Like I, That's the lowest bar of humor. Like I can be funny without dirty language. I can, I can, I can speak the, like when we lie. Like that's something like you carry something around internally when you lie. And so it says this set of stuff, it's stuff that you got to address because it works from the inside out. And then this set of stuff, you got to work because if you don't address that, that's stuff that works its way from the outside in. And so then he says this, instead of doing all of that, put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. And that's the end of the passage that we're going to read today, but I'll read that one more time. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Here's the bottom line. This is what Paul would say is the goal, that Jesus is our supreme goal in life. You're like, okay, Chris has absolutely lost it because Jesus is a person, not a goal. But here's what Paul is saying. The aim of our lives 
is Jesus. What we fix our eyes on, what we set our life toward, the direction we want to move is that we would become more and 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 more like Jesus, that we would live to know him, that we would live to show him, that we would become like him, and that we would think like him, that we would care about what he cares about, that we would care about who he cares about, that we would live lives that don't really work without Jesus. You could say this another way, the supreme goal of our life is to be so transformed that our lives would look like Jesus. To allow Jesus access to everything in our lives and to say, this needs to go. This needs to be developed. This needs to be eliminated. This, you need to die to this. This is something that I want to grow in you. And to let, let Jesus have permission in our lives to point out anything he wants to point out, to transform and change anything that he wants to change and transform. Our behaviors, our attitudes, our passions, our desires, the way we treat other people, that we would allow Jesus permission to transform anything and everything in our lives so that our lives to the untrained eyes of the people who are focused in the here and now, when they see us, they would see someone that looks so much like Jesus that the only thing that they could think is that, their, that, man, their life has been transformed by Jesus. They look, they sound, they treat, they love just like Jesus to where it's not so much about the things of, of, of the world here and now, but it's about what Jesus, who's matter, who matters for eternity, it's about the realities of heaven becoming the realities of earth through their life, through their obedience, through their speech, through everything about them. And so today, I want to give you two challenges and one question here at the end. The cha first challenge is simply this. Allow Jesus to transform us from the inside out. This is, this is, where Je this is that first list. This is that stuff that comes from inside of you. That some of you, there are things inside of you that do not reflect the reality that Jesus is Lord. There, there are things that are, are inside of us that do not reflect the reality that what God says is true. There are sometimes things inside of us that do not reflect the reality that I will spend eternity in, in, in somewhere. And, it, and it's either going to be with God or apart from God. And Paul says, if that's inside of you, it's time to let Jesus transform what's inside of you so that what's inside of you doesn't ever come outside of you, but it's transformed and it's changed so that what's inside of you actually does come outside of you. So that instead of greed, generosity comes out of you. Instead of evil desires, you have good desires for, for those around you. Instead of, instead of lustful thinking and wanting what's not yours and wanting who's not yours, you would want what, belong, what, what is yours and you would keep your hands off of anything that doesn't belong to you. Jesus wants to transform anything in you that would harm someone outside of you because Jesus cares about how you treat others. So would you allow Jesus to change your thinking? If you've got some thinking, if you've got some thinking where like, this is my truth and my truth is different than God's truth. In fact, you, you started to equate your truth with, with God's truth. It's time to change your thinking and accept the truth that comes from God about the world that you live in and about you. Maybe it's that you need to change your desires. Would you allow Jesus to transform your thinking, to transform your desires, to transform what comes from inside of you so that what comes out of you is what Jesus would have come out of you? And then secondly, here's the second challenge. Would you allow Jesus to transform you from the outside in? This is that second list. Would you allow Jesus to transform your habits your daily routines. If there's something about your daily routine that's not honoring to God, where God is not first in your daily routine, maybe it's time to change your habits. If, if there's something about like, what, here's this, like something I do every day and, and it hurts your body, it may be time to examine that and allow Jesus to speak into it and say, Jesus, if this is something that I need to let go of, I wanna let go of, I wanna die to that so I can be alive to you. Maybe it's how to change how we treat people. Maybe there's something about the way you continue it, that you have an anger issue. Or, 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 or that you, when, you, when it gets time to like 
you know, that you're great when relationships are good for you, but the second a relationship requires anything from you, you just, you know, call, call it off and you blow it up and like, I don't know what it is, but there's something about the way that you, that you treat people. And maybe Jesus wants permission today to address and to bring your eyes to the way that you treat people that causes a little bit of havoc in your life. Maybe it's that you would change your language. Maybe there's some jokes that you tell, maybe the way that you speak about women or the way that you speak about a minority, or you speak about other people, you speak about rich people, the way you speak about poor people, the way you speak about like that maybe the language that you use is harming people that God cares about. And it's time for you to give God permission to actually address your language. I, I, I just think for if, if we want to become like Jesus, this is where it begins. To humbly say to Jesus, Jesus, I give you permission to change me from the inside out and from the outside in. What, like, what, whatever, whatever that looks like, whatever that means, whatever areas of my life that I've been sensitive and I've been holding back from you and I've been hesitant to let you do, God, I give you permission today. Have your way in me. Have your way in what comes out of me. Have your way of what's inside of me because I want my life to look like your life. You are the supreme goal of my life. Not this, I mean, I got, like, I want all the stuff here and now too. Like, I want the house, I want the girl, like, I want all that kind of stuff. I want the car, I want debt free, I, I want the house, I want all of it. But more than I want any of that, I want my life to look like your life. I want you as the supreme goal of my life and for everything else to flow out of that. And then here's the, one, the last question I have for you Is there any area of your life that you're hesitant to, hesitant to let Jesus transform? They're like, hmm. Yeah, because I, because I've got my truth, and I like my truth. My truth lets me do pretty much whatever I want. And if I, like, you may be hesitant to let Jesus transform that. But I'm telling you, if you're hesitant to let Jesus transform that, that's the area that Jesus needs to transform the most. If there's something inside of you that goes, you know, like I, like I just need this in my life. Chances are that's the, the area and the moment in your life when you, when you surrender that to Jesus and allow him to transform and give him access to do what he wants to do in that. That's the area of your life where you will find the most freedom as you surrender it to Jesus. Is there any area of your life that you're hesitant to let Jesus transform? And if there is, would you today allow me to pastorally challenge you? Would you let Jesus transform it anyway? Because on the other side of your fear, on the other side of your hesitancy, on the other side of your, I don't really want to live without this and I don't really want to give this up. On the other side of your fear is a freedom and a peace and a joy and life that you have not known in a long time. And you can know that when you allow Jesus to be the supreme goal of your life and that everything about me, it wants to work toward becoming more and more and more like Jesus. He's supreme, and he's the supreme goal of our lives as we follow Jesus and as we set our eyes and we set our sights on the realities of heaven. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, today I thank you so much for who you are. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for Jesus, and I thank you that he is supreme over all. I thank you that he is the visible image of the invisible God. I thank you that he is our supreme source and our supreme sustainer and the supreme foundation of our life and our faith and our connection with you. And God, I thank you today that as we, as we think about who we want to be and what we want to attain and what we want to accomplish, I thank you that you have let us know that there is a supreme goal. There is an above and beyond everything else goal of life. That while all the other stuff is far too small to wrap our lives around, there is a Jesus, there is a Savior who came to die for us so that we could be set free from our sins and that he stands as the goal, as the one that we would live toward. And so God, in any way that our life doesn't reflect Jesus, doesn't look like Jesus, I pray that you would help us to be transformed, to become like Jesus. God, if that's working from the inside out and working on what's going on in our mind and in our heart and in our desires, God, I pray that you would help us to recognize that and to place it into your hands and to allow you to transform whatever you want to transform in us. And God, if that's working from the outside in and working on our behaviors and our language and what comes out of our mouth and the way that we treat, God, I pray that we would just be willing to surrender that to you as well and that you would give, that you would transform us from the outside in 
Because at the end of the day, God, Jesus is our goal. Jesus is who we want to be like. Jesus is who we want to love like, who we want to think like. So God, help us to become like Jesus. Would you help us today to have wisdom to recognize wherever this lands for us today and whatever area of our life we need to surrender to you. And God, would you give us the courage to actually open our hands to you, open our hearts to you, open our minds to you, open our relationships to you and give you the freedom to transform us in any way that you want. Help us to follow you in that. We love you, God. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
good? It's good. Our God is so good to us. is running out. It's 
running after me. Well, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you found today to be hopeful and encouraging and challenging and life-giving. And we hope that you are able to take a first step or a next step in your relationship with Jesus, that your life would be changed because of this 45 minutes that we spend together today. I just wanted to let you know a few next steps that you could take in connecting with our church beyond this online service. First of all, I want to let you know, if, the, if, if you want to give, we want to let you know the ways that you can do that. They're all popping up on screen right now. Uh, whether you want to give online, whether you want to give with Cash App by text or by sending a cash or check offering to our PO box. I want to say thank you so much for your generosity, for your faithfulness to God, for your belief in our church and our mission and our vision to keep creating experiences to help people take a first step or a next step in their relationship with Jesus. Thank you for your generosity, which allows us to do all of that. And then also wanted to remind you, if you have a need, we would love to hear from you right now. If you're in a season of need, if you're in a stretch where you have a need, um, we would love to hear from you so we know how we can pray for you, how we can partner with you maybe to meet your need, and how we can pastor you and be the church for you right now in your time of need. So if you have if you have a need that you want to let us know about, we'd love to hear from you either on Facebook, uh, by, by email, or by phone, and the, and the numbers and the email addresses and all that stuff is popping up on screen right now so that you, whether it's on a Sunday morning or on Tuesday night or whenever you may have a need, we just want to hear from you so we know how we can be the church for you in your time of need. Well, that's all we've got for you today. Next week is part four of Supreme, and I can't wait to see you back here for that or in, or in person for that. Until then, have a great week and keep being the movement.